Well, good morning, Sacramento. If you're just joining us, it's 8.38 a.m. It's a beautiful day out there, but make the most of it. Things look set to heat up dramatically. Finally, after all these years, we're getting something done. And I guess my patience finally paid off. I had told the police that me and my brother witnessed my dad murdering Chris and Peta. I was prepared to just give my testimony, but I knew I was putting my life in my hands. He can kill you, he can bury you in the backyard, and he's gotten away with it more than once. Yeah, I'm looking over my shoulder, but I have to make my dad accountable for his crimes and stop him from hurting somebody else. We just couldn't believe that we were in this position after so many decades. The FBI had tracked Boston down. We obtained information that he was staying at a senior care facility in Eureka, California. I was very vengeful. I wanted my pound of flesh off him. He was age 75. And all this time, he was still a free man. We were going to arrest Silas Dwayne Boston for the homicides of Peter and Chris. This guy has killed multiple people before, and I wasn't going to take it lightly. We felt that justice was within our grasp. We go to his room. And he's not there. I don't think he can be caught. He covers his tracks too well. My heart started beating. He's got away again. It made me sick to my stomach. Because I'm the snitch. He might be trying to find me to come and kill me. Where is he? We were assured he'd been under surveillance and that there is no way he can move anywhere. We determined that two days prior to us arriving in Eureka, he had transferred to another senior care facility in Paradise, California. We are flying along Highway 36, probably a four or five hour drive. We felt he'd slipped away again and we were not going to see justice again. Our concern is we don't know if the nurse is calling over there and we don't want him to go on the run. I come around the corner and sitting there in a wheelchair, kind of moving his self with his legs, is Dwight. You could see his eyes just got big. We tell him that he's under arrest for the murders of Chris Farmer and Peter Frampton. He really didn't say anything. If you didn't know what he had done to Peter and Chris, You'd be like, oh, that just looks like a nice old guy sitting there in a wheelchair. But you just feel kind of a coldness um, that was there. He was a bad guy that needed to go to jail. This was a win for Peter and Chris. Seventy-five-year-old Silas Dwayne Boston was tracked down by the FBI and arrested in a Paradise convalescent home. Charged with murdering a young Manchester couple in Guatemala nearly 40 years ago. Christopher Farmer and Peter Frampton from Manchester, a boyfriend, girlfriend. They'd just finished at university. They were celebrating their graduation with a round-the-world trip. Both Farmer and Frampton were tortured and hogtied, thrown in the middle of the ocean to drown. The case would go cold for nearly four decades. Someone from, from England had had the original file in their garden shed. You know, I mean, this does it get better than that? Yes. Got you, you black-hearted bastard. Silas Dwayne Boston was arrested after Greater Manchester Police reopened the case at the request of the victim's families. I went downstairs to tell Mum the good news. After 38 
very long years, he was finally in custody. We opened a bottle of champagne and raised a glass to Chris and Peter. Over 30 years of silence, I know what it meant to Charles to know he was arrested. He'd always begged the police to let us speak to the two boys. Once again, the case came alive. Everything changed. He's under arrest, he's in custody. Now it's actually going to happen. When I saw that mugshot for the first time, it was shocking because I hadn't seen him in so many years. He didn't look the same. I always knew that there was a monster beneath the mask, but now it's like the mask has been lifted. I felt physically ill. I couldn't look at it. At the time of the murders, Russell and Vince were 11 and 13, but in interviews this year, they told an FBI agent they saw their father kill the couple. We were very grateful that the boys were prepared to get onto the witness stand and testify against their, their father. I had felt very antagonistic towards the boys, but then I hadn't realized they were obviously scared stiff of him. If he's found guilty of killing Frampton and Farmer, he'll face the death penalty or life in prison. So how do you feel? We got him. Hooray, you know? Let's jump cartwheels and, you know, slap high fives all around. It was a relief of a huge burden. I didn't want to be afraid anymore. But I felt these mixed emotions. I'm the one that's started the machinery to put him to his death. That's my dad, you know? I'm... I'm killing my dad, the good guy with the bad guy. You can't separate the two. It's an extraordinary story, this, isn't it? A young couple from Manchester disappear nearly 40 years ago. And now, finally, the law authorities in the United States believe that they do know how they were killed, how they were murdered, and who was responsible. We wanted the world to know he was guilty. But I was aware that being arrested didn't mean that he was convicted. We knew we were in for a long and messy trial. All our faith and hope was put in Matt Seagal, the prosecutor. In 2015, I was the chief of the Special Prosecutions Unit of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of California. This was an extraordinary case. Two people were murdered, and the man who did it evaded justice for 38 years and his two sons say that they saw him kill them. You can't kill people. And if there's a prosecutable case of murder, it has to be charged. It's in the United States Constitution that people are entitled to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm a federal public defender, and I was appointed to represent Dwayne Boston in the case against him. I became a public defender because I wanted to represent people who didn't have the money to hire you know, fancy attorneys. The defense attorney is straight out of central casting for your federal public defender with a lot of experience and smarts. My job is to hold the government's feet to the fire, and I have absolutely no problem um, fighting that fight. They're innocent until proven guilty, and I believe in that very strongly. If you were accused of something, you would want me to represent you that way. I was glad that he was gonna get the best representation. It was a serious accusation, but we were gonna go 100% no matter who was representing him. Right, like, you can't just lock people up a jury of 12 regular people has to decide beyond a reasonable doubt, yeah, that happened, he did it. 
I only need one juror to have a doubt. Could we face the awful thought of getting an innocent verdict? Any seed of doubt in the story, one little chink in the armor, and he's walking out. I start reading the complaint, and it's a much stranger complaint than normal. To have a homicide case from the 1970s was incredibly unusual. To have a case that took place in allegedly Guatemala was highly unusual. And Vincent and Russell's story is very compelling, and it seems true on the surface. But when the story is being told with such creative details, it just doesn't ring true as people who are telling something 30 years later that actually happened. They corroborate each other. They're telling substantially the same story about what they saw because that is what they saw. The words that were spoken, supposedly Chris saying, what's your game, man, what's your game? The Billy Club broke after the beating. Even sitting with the naked person tied up below, none of it read to me like facts of a case. Those kind of details actually raise a red flag to me as being untruthful. When something very traumatic happens, your brain goes to places to protect you, and you sometimes can't remember details or can't even see details. There's a lot of studies about eyewitness identifications of traumatic events where one person's telling of it is completely different from another person's telling because their brains are just working in ways to protect them from this trauma. Neither one of the boys said, it's been a really long time. I was very traumatized by it. I put it out of my mind or I repressed it. And so I don't really remember, but I know I saw this thing happen. If there's no contemporaneous writing or contemporaneous way of recording, people just don't remember those things. The mind's not a tape recorder and memory's sometimes not exactly valid. But all I can do is tell the story of what I saw in front of my own eyes. Any effective defense would require a cross-examination for the ages of, of those guys. The motive for Russell and Vincent to lie about their dad was very apparent to me. I mean, that was something that just kind of screamed off the page. The boys were convinced from a very young age that their father had killed their mother. Everyone knows he's killed her. I'm going to tell you exactly what he did to my mom. The earliest memories I have of our mom, she was in the kitchen playing the Beatles. That was one of her favorite groups. Somehow we started calling her Mommy Mary Lou. And I just remember this warm feeling that she loved us kids and we were her whole world. When she met my dad, she was 17, which is still considered a minor. And my dad was a few years older. The story was she ran away with him with 25 bucks in her pocket. It scared her family, but she had fallen for dad. Dad could be very charming if he wanted to be, especially over women. At first, he was a caring dad, but he turned. He was doing drugs and partying and eventually being abusive. She had to get away from him. She started dating someone and filed for a divorce. But he wouldn't let her leave. 
he took her to an orchard and told her he was going to shoot her. While she was running, he shot her in the back. That he buried her in a shallow grave somewhere. We don't know where. Grandma told us, your dad showed me his hands. He had blisters on his hands from digging her grave. And he was crying and saying, I had to kill Mary. I had to shoot her because she was going to leave me and I didn't want to lose my kids. When she went missing, the police questioned my dad. He said that they were separated. She had emptied the savings account and she was dating this radio disc jockey. And he never saw her again. I think at the time, in the late 60s, a woman was thought that she should be in the kitchen, just not date anybody else when she's getting a divorce. It's like, hey, you know, she's going on with her life. She was getting away from his abuse. What were they thinking back then? He killed my mom in cold blood. They just took everything he said, this is the truth. They let him go. And then meanwhile, my mom's in a shallow grave somewhere. We haven't been able to find out where my mom is. My dad actually told us himself that we'll never find her in a million years and that he buried her in, in or near a creek bed and the creek bed caved in on her. Where could he have taken her? He told us that he loved my mom and that of all the people that he killed, she's the only one he regrets killing. When you murder somebody's mother for your own selfish needs and say, I did it because I love you, it really is that love? You sicken me. I think this was the first time he was able to commit a murder and talk his way out of it. And I think it set things up for the future for him, realizing that if he did things a certain way, he could get away with murder over and over again. When somebody's missing, it's horrible. You can't think about anything else. You, you can't come to terms with it desperate, absolutely desperate. You don't know what to do. You don't know who to turn to. I think it's human nature to want to know what happened, to get some kind of a closure, even though you know they can't come back. If my dad's convicted, he might finally tell me where he buried my mom. Vincent spent a tremendous amount of effort trying to get them to reopen the investigation into their mother's disappearance. Um, it's unclear whether she died. They never found a body. And they just simply weren't getting any traction there. They were told by family members from a young age that Peta and Chris had gone missing and that they had last been on the boat and that police officers were investigating Mr. Boston. So. They know he's a suspect in this. The story of Chris and Peta was always told in combination with, let's find him responsible for killing our mother. I'm looking for an opportunity to raise doubt about their credibility. In this case, I'm very confident that I have a lot to say. The attack on Vince and Russ is, you just made this up to get back at your dad because you think he murdered your mom, which is crazy in itself as a defense. So now Dwayne looks like a three times murderer who, when he kills, does his best to dispose of the bodies in a way that they'll never be found. So it's a tough position for the defense, in my opinion. It's very problematic for me, except I think the way I would do that is I would cross-examine and say, you believe that your father was responsible for killing your mother. 
you know that he was cleared of doing that. And that made you angry. You believed in your heart that that's what happened because that's what your grandmother told you. Why did your grandma tell you that? Maybe in her mind, she felt some guilt. And even though she would never turn in little Dwayne, her son, her baby, she wanted us to know the truth. She knew that he was killing people. She would chastise him. Dwayne, you can't be doing that. But she would tell us kids, you gotta keep the family circle intact. That's why he committed so many crimes and got away with them. During this investigation back in 1981, I know that his father knew where he was, but his father enabled him by concealing him. My grandpa pretty much funded the trip down to Mexico and Belize because dad was facing charges for statutory rape. I remember one night, I woke up and heard the young woman in distress. It wasn't unusual for him to bring home ladies, but this was different. And she was saying, just stop, no, please stop, and, 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 a, and a crying voice. The next morning, he's like, hey, about last night, dumb me up, shut the fuck up about that. This young lady who was under the age of consent, so they were able to press charges of statutory rape against my dad. Next thing we know, he went and got his passports and headed down to Belize. A few weeks later, Grandpa came down and uh, brought us money and bought us a boat. The Justin B. The rape charges were dropped for whatever reason. I don't know. Grandpa knew, but he didn't tell Dad. I think that if Dad knew, we would have come back home. It was just so galling to think if Boston had been told, he wouldn't have met Chris and Peter. You just think, I wish you'd never been there, you know? Their paths crossing the way they did. They were lambs to the slaughter. Dwayne was deep in this Western outlaw culture, doing crime, not talking about it, and he conveyed a lot of that forcefully for decades to his sons. It was a really big deal when they finally told the police what their dad had done. It restored your faith in humanity that they had tried to do something. They hadn't replicated his grotesque human nature, if you can call him human. He's an evil guy. It's actively killing people and hurting people. In my mind, he committed these crimes and he deserved to face judgment, even if it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. Obviously, in a modern case, we'd want to see photographs. We'd want to see that rope. We would want to see, you know, how their hands were bound. And a modern autopsy would document all of those things. The evidence we had was very old documents, lots of dead witnesses. We didn't have the autopsy report. And there's no DNA, which was strange to me. The last time the bodies were seen was in the 70s. By the records of the exhumation, they put the bodies under marked grave markers in Guatemala. This makes the case very strong 
if they have those bodies and they have DNA. I assume it's coming. We had sent some agents down to Guatemala to locate the graves of Chris and Peta. We had planned to exhume the skeletons and send those up to the FBI laboratory to be held uh, for trial. I was told it's really important because then it will give us a DNA match to yours. That the cemetery was very chaotic and it was proving very hard. Unfortunately, they couldn't find the grave sites. I was extremely disappointed they couldn't make that happen. We were horrified. There were photographs of their graves and it was a very well documented and witnessed exhumation. This was really worrying. It's very complex to decide that those bodies are Peta and Chris without DNA testing. Peta and Chris could have gotten off the boat and something could have happened to them after. I don't have to prove anything. I just raise reasonable doubt. If we could have recovered a body from that cemetery, gotten DNA out of it, you know, and matched it to the families, then we would have absolutely known in a completely incontrovertible way. But I just keep returning to the fact that we had two eyeball witnesses to these murders. They corroborated each other and they are corroborated by documents. There's a police port document that Charles Farmer got that says, hey, who was on the boat? It was Dwayne, Chris, Peta, Russ, and Vince. But Chris and Peta weren't on the boat when they got to Livingston. And we knew we had something when we had Peta's letter. 13th of June, 1978. Dear Mum, all our plans have changed. An American called Dwayne, who owns a Belizean boat called the Justin B, offered to take us up to Chechumal by sail. We thought it was an opportunity not to be missed, especially as Chris wants sailing experience. It puts her on the boat, the Justin B. It puts her with Dwayne and two kids. It's almost like she was speaking to us. Then the letter is posted on July 18th. That was about a week after the bodies washed up. So it wasn't Peter who sent that letter. I remember Dad looking at the envelope. If he mails it, then that gives him a few extra days. Because then they think, oh, they're still alive. He ended up mailing it in Livingston. And then, turns out that Boston saved a lot of stuff over time. My dad kept Chris's cassette tapes. Russ found them in my dad's belongings and handed them over to the police. It was horrible that Boston had kept hold of Chris's much-loved music tapes that he'd cherished and put together from all his vinyl records. It was just a further violation. That's powerful circumstantial evidence. And if the jury believes the two sons, the only verdict is guilty because they are eyeball witnesses to the murders. I was ready for it. I can't get wrapped up in if I'm going to be attacked personally or discredited or thrown under the bus. All I could do is tell the truth and be the best witness I could be. Bring it on. I have the truth on my side. Boston had been in custody for two months at this point. We were just absolutely desperate to get to trial. 
We were worried. They couldn't find the bodies, but we felt we had a very strong case because of Vincent Russell's testimonies and that we would win. We were asked if we wanted to seek the death penalty and my mother really without hesitation said no. There's something absolutely abhorrent about legal death. Although, you know, he's done unspeakable things. I don't think that killing to somebody really solves anything. We wanted to go quickly so we could get a conviction before anything happened to Audrey. But the government's not in charge of that. The court is. And so we had to persuade the court to set a speedy trial. We ended up in district court before the trial judge. The 75-year-old who wheeled into a Sacramento federal courtroom this afternoon seemed feeble and needed a listening device to hear court proceedings. But the Silas Duane Boston described in this federal complaint was anything but weak 38 years ago. When I saw Boston come into the courtroom for the first time, I noticed how awful he looked. He was obviously very ill, and we could see that before our eyes. He was in a wheelchair. He's on medication. He was losing weight already. I mean, he, he, was, he was a very sick man. If we were the last stop to being able to deliver justice for a double murder, then that had to happen. But the defense is trying to delay trial. We just couldn't commit to a sooner trial when we're not ready. If we needed attorney-client time with him to get the case together, he was going to have to be a little bit healthy. My mom wrote a letter to the judge. Dear sir, I'm writing to ask if you will please consider setting a date as soon as possible for the trial of Silas Duane Boston for the murder of my beloved son, Dr. Christopher Farmer, and his girlfriend, Peter Frampton. The brutal manner in which my son's life was taken has left an enduring and very painful gap in my family's life, which no amount of time will heal. But I will derive a sense of closure from knowing that his killer has been apprehended and appropriately sentenced. We were given a, a provisional trial date of October the 2nd, and we couldn't wait to face him in court. I was hoping every day that I would get that call telling me, be in this Sacramento court on this date at this time, and I, I was ready. I was ready. I, I, I would leave in a heartbeat. I wanted to look him in the eye across the courtroom and convey an unspoken message to him, got you. All I kept thinking is, how are they going to secure a conviction? Will they be able to provide unequivocal evidence? Will the jury decide to find him guilty? He has to be guilty. I just wanted to kill him. Mum was 92. I think she felt it was the last thing she could do for Chris to stand in that courtroom and face Boston. I want to draw a line under it. After all these years. We'd finally got him. Now let's go convict him. You get a call if your dad has passed away. He just died in custody. And my head just starts spinning. The message came through about two o'clock in the morning. It just said, Silas Dwayne Boston has died. I went and woke Mum up and just said he's dead. It was just so depressing. We were powerless again. When the suspect died in jail before standing trial, what impact did that have on you and your family? We were devastated. It was just a further blow. Uh, we came two weeks away from going over to Sacramento to give pre-trial evidence, and uh, he, he effectively exited life on his own terms. He didn't want us to have justice. 
We were told by his medical team that he refused food and his medicine. So in effect, he took his life. He knew that we knew he'd killed them. He couldn't face us. Four months in custody doesn't really equate to the four decades where we didn't know what had happened. I knew that this case had been ever present in their moment to moment daily lives, but criminal cases and criminal trials do not necessarily bring people any peace. He might not have been convicted, and then what? Do you have your peace? Do you have your closure, even though there's no jury conviction? I'm disappointed. It would have been a great, great trial, but what happened to him was always what I had planned for the case, in the sense that he didn't walk free again post-arrest. His sons were essential in providing what justice we could provide in this case. Death is pretty permanent. There's no coming back from that. No matter what feelings I had toward him, this was a finality, a chapter closing. He's never going to be on this planet again. This evil monster is gone. I remember we'd go to the parks here in Sacramento and fly kites, and he tied the kite onto a fishing line. And it got so high in the air that it was just a little dot. And he's like, whoa, that's the highest kite in the world. And we're like, yay, it's pretty cool. He wasn't always bad. He wasn't always a horrible person. And that's what made it rough. If he was an asshole all the time, it'd be easy to deal with. But when he... It's as confusing as a child. It's like, this is a cool dad that you want to bond with. But you know what he's capable of. The evil that he did, it had such a reach. Not just for my family, but the Bramptons and, and his own family. A lot of people have suffered. Everybody that could have known my mom, she was an amazing artist. She could have shared that art with the world. Or Chris was a doctor, 25 years old. Think of all the lives that he could have saved. Pita was an attorney. Think of all the people that she could have helped. And it's not just that one person, it's everybody in their circle. I can remember Chris was about 12. We were out for a walk and I had a moment of complete happiness. He and I were walking hand in hand and I thought, you know, how lovely life is. I do remember that, when we were just the two of us together. It was a fleeting moment, and I don't think I've ever quite experienced that again. Boston never gave Vincent Russell the satisfaction of knowing where he'd buried. Mary Lou. I'll forever have the pain of losing my mom. I am trying to find her so I can bring her home. As human beings, we want that closure. Letting her rest in peace instead of buried like trash in a shallow grave somewhere. Maybe it's beautiful, maybe it's picturesque if there's a river there and, and mountains or something. But there's an unexplainable feeling of wanting to know where she is.
Even now, I still feel that there's somebody missing. Do you think one of your ways of coping was this fight for justice? Oh, absolutely. Law enforcement failed us time and time again. Our family it was the only point of cohesion, the, the only constant. Now to an update on a story which we have reported on North West tonight several times in the past. The murders of the Manchester couple Chris Farmer and Peter Frampton on a yacht 40 years ago in Guatemala. Well, their families were told their remains had been lost forever and even the FBI couldn't find them. But new clues led Chris's sister to a remote graveyard. When you lose somebody, the most devastating thing is everybody else forgets them. But you don't, and you don't want to. What survives after death is love. As a hurt party, you want justice. It doesn't make amends, but you at least feel that you have done everything you can to have avenged their murders. That's amazing. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I was just amazed to find them. It was such a relief. Boston never counted on us having the fortitude and strength and love to fight back for Chris and Peter. He thought they would be just forgotten and disappear into that ocean, never to be seen again. But how wrong was he? They will live on in a different sort of way, in a different plane. Nice. <laughs>
slime. You well, I you think you look nice. Remember. Heard out that nice you ready, Miss Albi. Was. Uh, Charles, it up. Heard Faggy, what I'm so bad. Sneaky, I was not dead. So, Sarah, I look mad. So sneaky, so we shall so much deep. Stay, you snitty, I was the worst of it. Even the such that squad, but not worst of it. Snarebs, alias, no circs, ill chaps, Sammy, on these finished ones that we with you. Well, yes, yeah, my mish, I should as a yes before. Even it's such a look to have an easy lips now. Yeah, we both in the caramel. Snash, this nash ball, mammy. Yeah, you should never sneak down the region with me, sir. Heard out, sir, you can now. Yes, must now, you wouldn't you. Snack. Let's get that list back in the world, but not now, ready, sir. Now, save me, so, hurry, sir. Now, so, it. Do I have a nozzle here, sir, sir? Now, I've heard my off, sir, sir, now, me, guys, no, see, look, sir. I'm a kind of near power crane there, and I see the near power kid. Sir, I'm seeing this business, and they'll all bow loose, and I hear with half of this man, and I'm just going to get that. Yeah, well, we're just not going to leave a minute, and I need to leave a spot, but I'll be mad to see him. I forgot this time, that right? David, I am a young dog. Here is the mess on my feet, all but. And they're back up for the new feet. Snake had your heel of surf, and I'll leave me in it. 
that I've been caught on Mark News. We're still a lot in our house and the beast's out now.
Long mail be here, be here, we am lost, stealing off, be on me, this good, mix nice, be off it. I have my guys go on the one, the beer's still off, but I'm not gonna If I had a one, and almost beer's still in the mix, please. This is the last there's no energy. There's we Sir, <laughs> 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 <